What I'm going to do today is just a couple of, of um, preliminary points. The first point is that this is really a, a very preliminary set of, of ideas. What I'm trying to do is bring together um, sort of two areas of work that I've been engaged in the last year or so, one of them concerning territory and the other concerning the so-called right to not be excluded. So these are very exploratory ideas and um, I'm still working them through, so obviously I'm very, very keen for your criticisms and, uh, and feedback. That would be immensely helpful. And the second point is, because this is sort of the opening plenary, I thought I'd be deliberately kind of broad, you know, arm wavy. Um, and my tendency, uh, as was suggested in the article about bus stops and beggars, is that I tend to be a little more focused and uh, nitty gritty. Um, I'll be a bit nitty gritty today, but I'm also going to be a little more uh, broad and capacious in my, uh, in my comments and in exploring this question of property, territory and the rights to not be uh, excluded. Let me make some preliminary uh, comments. My, when I talk about property, my focus is in, on property in land. And of course, property uh, rights are going to be uh, applied to multiple resources, and I'm sure we'll hear some of those uh, explored today. But uh, my interest is particularly is in regards to, uh, to land. And there are a couple of things that we can say about property in land and property rights in land. Uh, and Laura Undercuffler has a useful article that came out a couple of years ago in which she points out that property rights in land are distinctive as compared to other rights, such as speech or association or rights of, of, of religion. The first point, and it's an important one, is that land, as the economists would say, is a rivalrous good. If I have land, you don't have land. If I grow potatoes, you don't get to grow potatoes. Now, the I could be a group, but it's, it could be an individual. But nevertheless, uh, it's a zero-sum a zero -sum game. The second point that Undercuffler makes is that property rights have no meaning apart from state protection. If the state disappeared, speech would continue to exist. But if the state disappeared, property, in a formal sense, would, uh, would not. Property is meaningless without state protection. As an idea, property is the establishment of a series of state-sanctioned and enforced entitlements. It gives you the right to claim rights, in other words. As such, a system of property rights, under Cuffler reminds us, sustains a prevailing system of entitlements. It is inherently a means of ensuring a status quo. It's one that is intrinsically resistant to change, because if we allocate rights, then that becomes uh, 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 cast in, in stone, as it were. This, this matters. Property is a system of relationships, fundamentally, between people. Not exclusively between people, but certainly between people uh, in uh, an important sense. When we organize and distribute property rights, we organize and distribute social privileges and ensure access to resources for some and not for others. The legal realist Morris Cohen, the US legal realist Morris Cohen, pointed out nearly a century ago that property is a form of delegated sovereignty. We think of property as this privatized bubble, but of course it's produced by and sustained by the state in a fundamental sense. Private property rights, Cohen points out, protect individual control and exclusivity. Therefore, because of the rivalrous, the zero-sum nature of land, to provide property protection to one person is to, by definition, deny that right to another person. Property rights, Cohen reminds us, exclude others from using the things that are assigned to me. He says, quote, if everybody else, or, sorry, if somebody else wants to use the food, the house, the land, or the plow that the law calls my own, he has to get my consent. To the degree that these things are necessary to the life of my neighbor, the law thus confers on me a power, limited but real, to make him do what I want. In a famous concluding comment, dominion over things is also imperium over our fellow human beings. And that's a crucial point that I want us to try and remember. Property law, however, Cohen points out, does more than protect people in their possessions at any one moment. It also determines what people shall acquire going forward. 
Protecting the property right of the landlord means giving the landlord the right to collect the rent next month, the month after, and so on. Property rights thus determine the future distribution of such goods. And pushing Cohen beyond Cohen the way Cohen would like to go, um, under capitalism, such relationships become deeply asymmetrical. They become locked in as a, as a status quo. They become, again, facts on the ground. Property rights help organize and sustain, under capitalism, dominant and entrenched relations of power, structured in relation to class, to gender, to race, and so on. This is this rather ascetic looking gentleman in the bottom corner here is uh, the Canadian political economist C.B. McPherson. And C.B. McPherson, I think, has been unjustly forgotten since his death uh, a, a few decades ago. C.B. McPherson uh, was a very interesting hybrid. On the one hand, he was a Marxist, a Marxist political economist in a, in a theoretical sense, but he was also a liberal. Uh, and that combination of, of uh, a political economy and, and, and liberalism, a concern with the exploration of relations of power as produced by uh, capitalist property relations and uh, keen attention to democracy and liberty make him, uh, for my purposes, quite interesting. And he was, as I'm sure some of you know, a very keen scholar of property. All roads, he said, led to property, which for a property person is, of course, you know, uh, uh, it makes one very happy. Um, and as you can see in this quote, he draws from Marxist political economy to point to the manner in which property rights generate insiders and outsiders. Freedom for the pike, as Tawney puts it, is death for the minnow. Um, denial or limitation of access is a means of maintaining class-divided societies with a class domination which thwarts the humanity of the subordinate and perverts that of the dominant class. The extent and distribution of that access is set by the system of property. Now, this is rather old school, <laughs> but um, I think it's one that perhaps it's worth going back to. Uh, certainly within a North American context, and perhaps in other contexts less so, but certainly in a North American context, that basic relationship uh, is too often uh, neglected and, uh, and forgotten. So there's something about the old school that's worth going back to. And one point I'll just mention is his attention to access. And I want to come back to that theme. Access, I think, is crucial uh, here. And there's a very useful essay by Rebo and Peluso uh, who talk about access uh, as the ability to benefit from things. And access is useful because it directs empirical attention to who gets to do what where, who gets access and under what conditions. And as they point out, a range of powers affects people's ability to access resources and to do so differentially. Different people can draw on different bundles of power, including property rights. And it's not just property rights that they're interested in, but that's my concern here. Some people and in in institutions control resource access whilst others must maintain their access through those who have control. Now, property in land <coughs> and questions of access have a consequential geography. Jeremy Waldron noted some years ago that property rules provide a basis for determining who is allowed to be where. The rules of property give us a way of determining, in the case of each place, who is allowed to be in that place and who is not. And as uh, Waldron points out, this shapes liberty, this shapes fundamental freedoms. Freedom to perform an action requires the availability of a space in which one is able to perform that uh, action. If a space is governed by a private property rule, then all things being equal, the owner who is the, o the individual who is the owner of that land will determine who can use that space and for what purposes. Now, this matters. Those without access to property, they can call their own. His attention is, towards, is to homelessness, but I want to extend that more generally. Those without access to property, they can call their own, or those with more contingent and vulnerable rights of access and use face diminished freedom. And this points us to, to territory. a crucial and, I think, under-examined relationship between property and territory. It's rather surprising because when you think of land and property, 
the first impulse is to think about territory, but nevertheless, for various reasons that we can get, in, get into, legal scholars tend not to attend to questions of uh, the territorial dimensions of property, because property is not about things, it's about relations. And geographers tend not to think about territory and property. They're much more interested in territory and, and the state in a more formal sense. So there's a bit of a gap in that regard, and it's one I've tried to unpack a little bit in a paper that's just coming out in the journal called Progress in Human Geography. And what I try and argue there is that, is that territory can be usefully thought of as a, as a practice, as a technology, not, not as a space, but as a, set, a means by which we organize a, 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 a set of, of relationships. Property is relational. Territory helps organize those relations. relations. Territory can materialize those relations, it can also organize those relations, it can stabilize those relations, it can also, to some extent, destabilize those relations. Territory can serve to classify, to communicate, to enforce, to inscribe, and to legitimize a set of entitlements, property entitlements. Property relations in capitalism are territorialized in quite particular ways. And when one looks at other societies and other times, one finds property being territorialized quite differently. It's interesting, I think, then, to try and trace the ways in which the territory of property, at least in the liberal capitalist sense, has historically been produced, the practices through which it works, and the beliefs that it sustains. Much of this turns on the relationship between territory and property's right to exclude, which for many is the sine qua non of property. Exclusion operates in many ways. It's not exclusively through territorial configurations, yet nevertheless, property in land is clearly expressed and communicated by and enforced through territory. Now, exclusion needs some more attention. Um, Hall, Hirsch, and Lee, in their book, Powers of Exclusion, uh, talk about the work of exclusion, suggesting that exclusion works in at least three ways. Firstly, already existing access of land maintains the exclusion of other potential owners. It's all been taken up, there's nothing left for me. Secondly, people who have access lose land. They become excluded, they were insiders and now they become outsiders. And thirdly, people who lack access are prevented from getting it at all. All of these forms of exclusion can be territorialized. And the point here is that exclusion is not an ethereal condition, but it's materialized, and materialized very often through the work of territory. It's manifested in the command of the private security officer, or the police officer, or the 17th century enclosure hedge, or the disapproval of the cafeteria owner looking upon the homeless person who spent too long with their cup of coffee. Most of us, of course, benefit from the right to exclude because we have access, most of us, to a secure relationship to property. The right to exclude can be very beneficial, ensuring access to secure and stable resources, including housing. However, many people experience a more ambiguous or ambivalent or even negative relationship to exclusion and its territorial manifestation. How can we begin to think about the relationship between exclusion, property, and territory, particularly in regards to the more vulnerable? Well, one way is, I think, in relation to the notion of precarity. Precarity is a condition of enhanced vulnerability and uncertainty. It's become quite fashionable in the literature to now talk about Precarity. Precarity is understood both as a set of objective conditions produced through the deregulation of working conditions of labor markets uh, and shifts in housing markets that produce enhanced vulnerability for many uh, people. It also can be thought of as the experience of such situations, the affect produced by precarity. Precarity is a concept that can be usefully tied to questions of property and to property law. One way to define precarity is as a situation that is liable to be changed or lost at the pleasure or will of another. 
a relationship that can be changed at any moment, defined by one of the uh, uh, partners in that relationship. So there's a power relationship. And in civil law, apparently, we talk about the precarium. The precarium is a contract which allows someone to use something as long as the owner allows, like a tenancy at will, I suppose, in common law. It's made on request, from whence a prayer, precarious, to prayer, to pray, to beg, to entreat. It can be revoked at any time. Hence, the grantee's hold on the land is said in law to be precarious. It's based on a prayer. Property relations in contemporary society, as expressed in housing and labour markets, can be said, in that sense, to be profoundly precarious in terms of the legal relations, property relations that are at play. But I want to extend, expand precarity a little bit. Precarity, I don't think, is a, is a new phenomenon. Uh, Nancy Etlinger, in a recent article, uh, no, it's some years ago, seven years ago or so, uh, argued that we need to think more generally about precarity. It's not as some unique moment in the sort of contemporary neoliberal uh, 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 c condition. Precarity is also far from static, but, but dynamic. It's, it's changing and can be thought of in an historical sense. Thus, it becomes useful to think about the production of precarity. The production of colonial settlement in the part of the world in which I live in the 19th and early 20th century depended quite clearly on a remaking of property rights and a remaking of territory. The effect of which was to reframe a set of practical movements and uses of space into trespass. Those who had access historically and use of land now found themselves increasingly in a precarious situation, subject to the will of others. This is a quotation from a, uh, a man called uh, Chief Adolf from 1912. He was the chief of the Fountain uh, Band, as it became, Indian Band, in southwestern British Columbia. It's a comment made to a commission, provincial commission, um, that was exploring the question of reserve land in the province. And to me, it's a very striking uh, comment. A white man, he said, came along, and he preempted the land right inside the Indians' road, and he took part of that wagon road. He told the Indians, we were not to go there again. He said, it is all my own. One of the Indian men went over to chop a tree down, and the white man told him to leave that tree alone, because he said, that is my wood, and I'm going to sell it at Lillooet. Lillooet is a town down the road. It's very spare, written, said by somebody whose language is presumably not, uh, first language is not English, but it speaks volumes, I think, to the, the remaking of a set of relationships uh, and the production of a condition of profound precarity produced by and sustained by uh, a set of relations of violence, law, racism, and capitalism. And this image this comes from Cole Harris's wonderful book called Making Native uh, Space. Um, this shows uh, two members of the so-called Harrison River Indians in 1867 in this remade landscape, a logged landscape with a new geometry of, of property lines and fences with native people perched in a very vulnerable uh, sense outside this landscape, a transformed landscape, a landscape of precarity. Expulsion, in that sense, entails both the remaking of property relations and the remaking of territory and the production of a new set of relations, in this case, those of precarity. We need not only think about the production of precarity, we need to think also about the continuing performance of uh, precarity. Here's my Danish content. Uh, this is uh, Eric Heddingsen's. Uh, Eric Henningsen was a social realist, a um, uh, picture from 1892 called Eviction. And if you Google eviction uh, images, <laughs> Eric Henningsen comes up. Uh, so there's why he's in the picture. Uh, eviction is also performed through multiple enactments, including within the workplace as well as in regards to, to housing markets. A tenancy, 
a rental tenancy, entails the ownership of a temporary right to use land or property in which a lessee holds rights of real property under certain conditions, so it's actually a quasi-feudal relationship, under certain conditions, the, the landlord can evict or remove the tenant from rental property. <clears throat> and under landlord-tenant law, this formally denotes the so-called recovery of property by virtue of a superior title. Right? The lessee holds superior title, the tenant holds a conditional right to use that, which can be replaced uh, under certain conditions. The word eviction derives from the Middle French of insert, which means literally to overcome or to conquer. And as you can see from Henningsen's picture, it is, at the end of the day, a territorialized process where insiders or conditional insiders become outsiders and left, in this case, in the snow. An eviction process in my part of the world, uh, as I'm sure would apply in uh, Denmark and elsewhere, uh, entails a formalized process, it has to go through a series of hearings, but ultimately it can lead to enforcement by a court-ordered bailiff who can remove the possessions and the tenant. The bailiff can sell the possessions to cover the costs of their service. Items that are not deemed worthy of cost recovery may be left at the curb. There's a wonderful paper by Gretchen Purser in Critical Sociology, um, came out I think last year, in which he points out that evictions have been woefully understudied. There's been scholarship on uh, uh, the mortgage crisis and the repossession process, but evictions, which are ongoing, routine, uh, um, uh, affecting many, many people, uh, are, are surprisingly uh, under-examined. And what she documents in her piece, it's a piece about the US, is what she calls the circle of dispossession, describing the, the actual clearance of possessions from court-ordered evictions and the degree to which that actually uses marginalized people to clear out the stuff. So those who are actually excluded from what Ananya Roy would call the American paradigm of so-called property citizenship are actually used to enforce that relationship. It's, it's a vicious uh, circle of dispossession, as she points out. Eviction is also spatialized. It differentially affects particular people, right? Most of us, I'm sure, have uh, thankfully had not had the experience of uh, eviction, but for many people uh, at the margins, this is a not uncommon experience. This uh, image is from a remarkable um, project called the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project in San Francisco, which is, on, is online, as you can see. I'd recommend you take a look at it. And it shows the downtown center of um, uh, the, 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 the core of San Francisco, each of those red dots is an eviction, uh, a no-fault eviction, so-called. So that's a routine eviction, you know, the lease expired, um, the landlord needed the property back to renovate it. Uh, from 1997 to 2015, the blue circles are actually oral histories that you can click on and get the stories of those people, the affect of precarity, if you like, those people experiencing that, uh, that process. Um, uh, and so you can see, you know, people, uh, particularly in downtown, center, downtown areas, uh, uh, more marginal people are more likely to experience uh, those uh, relationship. And we can think, of course, of other forms of exclusion, not just in relation to, to housing markets, but in regards to, to uh, um, workplace uh, forms of uh, property relations and so on, and connect those also to questions of territory and to liberty. And here's McPherson again. He's looking a bit happier now. Uh, which is good, he's in colour because he's offering us a more colourful, uh, optimistic take on uh, property. Because McPherson is not anti-property, he's trying to open up property to political possibility. And what McPherson argues is that we should not think exclusively of property as private property, nor should we think exclusively of property in regards to the right to be, the right to exclude. He insists, as you can see, for the simultaneous recognition of a right which he calls common property, which we can talk about later, predicated on the right to not be excluded from the use or benefit of a thing. And you'll note that he places that right next to the right to exclude. The right to not be excluded entails a claim, as you can see, 
to access from the use or benefit of a thing. And this isn't simply a right to access public property. This isn't a right to access you know, the parks and plazas and libraries. This is a more fundamental claim in regards to the workings of property more generally. And he says it's a right. It's not a claim. It's a right. It's a right because, of course, property is not an end. It is a means to an end. The question then becomes, what are those ends? Um, McPherson reminds us that we've thought in rather narrow terms of the ends of property as exclusively those of utility sort of Benthamite utility, profit maximization, individual satisfaction, and uh, so on. He argues that those ends also are and should be those that allow humans to exercise their own capacities. This is based on the proposition that the end of every human being is to use and develop their own human capacities, creativity. Man, he says, is not a bundle of appetites seeking satisfaction, but a bundle of conscious energies seeking to be exerted. And what he's doing here, of course, is echoing a much more ancient and long-standing line of thought from Aristotle onward uh, that emphasizes the value of human flourishing and its relationship to property, arguing that these non-utilitarian ends are pluralist, diverse, and often inherently incommensurable. The problem is that the dominance of a system of private property rights sustained purely on exclusion, advancing those more utilitarian ends, sustains such fundamental freedoms. The right to exclude thus must be supplemented by the right to not be excluded. I told you this would be arm-wavy. This is very arm-wavy. Um, but I think it's, it's nevertheless interesting. Non-exclusionary rights, he says, are valuable in that they provide access to the resources necessary for people to advance their own uniquely human capacities. Liberty necessarily includes not only your capacities, but your ability to exert those capacities, to do something with those capacities. Liberty, therefore, must include, McPherson says, access. It's not just a generalized claim, it's a claim to access. Liberty, he says, must therefore treat as a diminution of a man's or woman's powers whatever stands in the way of his or her realizing his or her human end, including any limitation of that access. So he's trying to open up property, open up property to more democratic possibilities, rejecting an individualistic conception of property. Of course, we hold, we're held in sway by a particular understanding of property as about private property, as about individuals, as about economic utility, and uh, so on. We have treated, he says, as the very paradigm of property what is really only a special case. Now, McPherson treats the right to not be excluded in generalized terms. He wasn't a geographer, so he didn't attend to territory, but I would want to point to the importance of territory in such struggles. The right to exclude is territorialized. The right to not be excluded is also worked in and through territory in an important sense. This image here, which I've been just left leaving hanging for you, is an image from Vancouver's downtown east side. It's from the mid-1990s, and it's in regards to... It shows a picture... It shows, it shows uh, uh, some hoardings around what was then the Woodward's department store, um, which I've written about. Uh, what we see here, on the one hand, the Vancouver Security K-9 Patrol is the right to be excluded in very manifest terms. But the graffiti you can see that's been uh, stenciled on the outside of this graffiti, of this uh, hoarding, uh, speaks, I think, also to the right to not be excluded. Give it back, it says, 100% ours. These premises are protected by the community of the downtown east side. So it's an interesting inversion uh, there. Which takes us to the downtown east side, where I want to uh, um, spend the balance of this presentation. Downtown east side is not unusual. Um, it's an inner city area in the center of the city of Vancouver. It contains a large um, population of precarious people in many senses. Um, it has experienced increasingly intensified struggles regarding gentrification-induced displacement, which is manifested very often in struggles around eviction, kicking people out of rental housing. There's a large population of people 
living in private hotels, residential hotels, uh, under very precarious uh, conditions. Uh, so uh, living under precarious tenancies in a legal sense. And what we find increasingly is the creative use of hotel owners to evict uh, their tenants in order to generalize, generalize more uh, profits, particularly through a use of what's called renoviction, um, which is a combination of re renovation and eviction. Uh, it's possible to raise the rent uh, beyond mandated rent, rent increases if they can justify it, if the owner can justify it in terms of renovations which of course allows for a good deal of flexibility, uh, activists point to the way in which landlords are renovicting under um, very dubious uh, conditions, the effect of which is to threaten the, the steamroller of gentrification in this part of, not threatening, it's realizing the steamroller of gentrification within the downtown east side. One outcome of these struggles was a tent city established in the summer of 2014 in a place called Oppenheimer Park in the very center of the the downtown east side. And it was in a sense, uh, well, there was many things, but one of, it, one of the uh, rationales for the tent city was as a protest over access to housing. A protest, in other words, over property arrangements and its territorialization, the cost of housing, the access of housing. It included many homeless people, those who, of course, by definition, lack any access to private property at all and are thus forced to live their lives out in public uh, property under increasingly precarious conditions. It's crucial, however, to recognize the intersecting nature of property relations and territory. This is not just a story of poverty in one sense, and you can see the TP in the middle. It's a large number of uh, indigenous people who live in the downtown east side in what is um, a settler society. Indigenous people, of course, face intensified forms of exclusion based not only on poverty, but the colonial remaking of land, property, and territory. And this became interesting when the city, in the later part of 2014, issued an expulsion order, an eviction order, um, based on its title to the park. It's time to leave, they said. This is what the First Nations organizers involved in the tent city responded. We, the indigenous people here today in Oppenheimer Park, do hereby assert our Aboriginal title. Our people have held title to this land since time immemorial, and we are exercise, exerting our right to exclusive authority, recognized as an inherent element of our title over this land and this camp. We now require, we now require that you leave this place <laughs> and cease any attempts to remove people or their belongings from this place. So they tried to evict the city from its own, uh, its own park. Which raises some interesting questions about, this of course is a claim to not be excluded, but also they're invoking the right to exclude at the same time, which is an interesting point that I think we want to unpack a little bit. There's a, uh, this isn't simply a, a binary between these two logics, but uh, speaks to their complicated relationship. As you would probably be not surprised uh, to hear, the city's injunction was ultimately upheld by the, um, by the courts between competing rights, Mike decides, uh, territory and property were uh, remade. Yet the, the site remains, the whole downtown east side remains a site of continued uh, struggle. And what's interesting is that Oppenheimer Park itself is at the core of a struggle, as we've seen, against gentrification-induced displacement, struggles around eviction in general terms. One way in which this was manifested, as you can see it on the left here, was in a report issued by an activist group in 2011 called Zones of Exclusion. And what it does is it documents the increasingly uh, exclusionary territorialization territorialization of the downtown east side as gentrification begins to, to kick in. That place that we used to go to, we can't go there anymore. We're not welcome anymore, right? It's become a shishi uh, a microbrewery. Uh, it's become a, a restaurant. Uh, or it's simply that unit of, of social housing has now turned into student housing. And therefore, we have become excluded from that. So there's a sense in the report not only of very direct exclusion, but also a sense of a more kind of generalized exclusion, the exclusion of possibilities. The universe of possibilities has become uh, diminished. Exclusion not only constrains, it threatens to take something away. 
A sense of what is at stake is evident in the simultaneous attempt to carve out a so-called social justice zone in the core of the downtown east side, at the centre of which is, the, is Oppenheimer Park, where the tent city occurred. And this is an image produced by a, a local activist called Diane Wood. The social justice zone was seen as protecting principles and resources that are of value. It's a space where low-income people and their basic human and social needs, quote, have priority over profit, unquote. It's imagined as a, quote, place where low-income and vulnerable people have a right to be and won't be pushed out. So it's a claim for the right to not be excluded and one that entails a right to re-territorialize a set of property relations. But Oppenheimer Park is worth digging a little further into. Territory not only has a history, sorry, territory not only has a geography, it also has a history. Oppenheimer Park was named after the former city mayor, Oppenheimer, who was a land speculator in the 1880s. For Musqueam and Squamish First Nations, the park is part of their traditional territory, which includes valuable resources, or included valuable resources before it was paved over. The territorial grid that created the park, sustained, of course, by state violence, displaced them from their traditional territory, although, as we can see, they continue to maintain a claim to, to title. The park also holds, every year, a Japanese-Canadian festival. It's located in Oppenheimer Park because the surrounding area was the node for a large Japanese-Canadian community. You can see images here of baseball players uh, who were using the park. That Japanese-Canadian community was forcibly removed during the Second World War. Their property was also liquidated. This is something, as mentioned, that um, I'm loosely involved in, and Jordan Stanger-Ross is here, um, uh, the director of that uh, project, and will be speaking uh, uh, about that during the conference. What's important is that the festival organizers, the contemporary festival organizers, hold this event uh, at this site every year, uh, when the tent city unfolded, in an important act of solidarity, elected to move the festival to a neighboring site and opposed the tent city's removal. The site is also, we can keep layering it, the site is also closely affiliated with labor organizing in the earlier years of the century, including a gathering in 1912 of a group called the IWW, the International Workers of the World, or the Wobblies, who were a radical union uh, group uh, who sought to um, mobilize the, the most marginal uh, workers. The problem being, of course, was that because of the territorialization of property, they could not access the workplace. So they organized on the streets. They organized in the parks, in what were called free speech uh, protests, uh, which, as you can see, the authorities were not always entirely supportive uh, of. As in Oppenheimer Park, we can, I think, find numerous examples of people and organizations engaged in challenges to the territory of property and its exclusionary logic, articulating in various ways the right to not be excluded. We can think about squatters. This is Homes Not Jails from San Francisco. Uh, we can think about uh, travelers. In the middle here, we can think about the uh, sit-down strikers um, from 1937 Detroit um, who occupied the workplace. Uh, in the, a process to democratize uh, the workplace. And I should note, sit-down strikes were used by Walmart workers in Los Angeles uh, just, just, just a year ago uh, or so. We can think also of uh, anti-racist organizers. This is the, uh, um, uh, the uh, Greensboro, North Carolina um, uh, protests uh, at the exclusion of people from um, cafeterias, uh, as well as contemporary indigenous activists who, as we speak, are in places like British Columbia, um, seeking to exclude and, in a sense, not be excluded from discussions around the um, uh, organization of uh, oil pipelines. Their 
status, their precarious status of these various groups is in many senses, senses shaped by the exclusion generated in part by properties territory. So who they are and how, what their relationship is, is in part structured by a set of relations to space and to property. Their struggles, moreover, center not only on property relations, but crucially also on their territorial form. It matters where people are. It matters that the sit-down strikers are in the workplace as opposed to being on the picket line. In so doing, I want to suggest they articulate these outlaws a right to not be excluded. Now, much of this is directed at private property, though not exclusively. The tendency very often is to think of these struggles separately as discrete forms of resistance. Now, there are clearly profound dangers in bringing these together and crunching together, apart, crunching together some of that uh, specificity. But I also think potentially there is merit in thinking about them through the lens of territory, property, and the right to not be excluded. So, to quickly conclude, what I've suggested is that the right to not be excluded, thought of through a territorial lens, may be a useful device for hooking up disparate struggles regarding property and liberty, although, of course, we need to be attentive to the specificity of such struggles. The right to not be excluded, I think, is also useful because it connects questions of exclusion and access, which is also something we uncouple. We think about exclusion and we think about struggles and resistance, the right to, if you like, not be excluded. But as McPherson reminds us, we need to think about those two things together and simultaneously. We also, following, again, Hall, Hirsch, and Lee, need to be attentive to what they call the double edge of exclusion. Exclusion can expel the marginal, yet the marginal also very often want exclusive rights. Right? They want the right to be, they want the right to exclude. The tenant wants the right to a secure tenancy because they want to be able to resist the, uh, the, uh, the predations of the, uh, of the landlord. The right to not be excluded also, I think, provides a useful social context for the discussion of property, the social dimensions, the differentiated social dimensions of the work of property and territory. Exclusion is productive of and produced through particular social configurations that generate systematic and deeply entrenched relations. The experiential force of exclusion and the salience of the right to not be excluded are also socially differentiated. That, I think, becomes useful in also in terms of discussions around commons, where it's easy to apply commons in a just very generalized sense that would include not only the marginal but also the... Um, the, the affluent homeowner that seeks to form a, uh, uh, um, a gated community. And finally, I think there's an important link to territory that needs to be attended to. Uh, territory is a means through which the relations of property are organized, both in terms of exclusion and struggles for access. Thank you very much for your attention.